All righty. So I'll, I'll start off this discussion of galaxy photometry and DM. Um, the first part of my talk is actually going to be have a lot in common with Conrad's. Um, hopefully that won't make it too boring. Uh, I think I sort of bring up things from a slightly different angle, but in many cases he's made the, made my points for me, and in a lot of cases done a better job and made it a little more quantitative. Um, but I am going to start the talk by sort of reintroducing photometry and the way we think about photometry. Um, and in a lot of cases, this is about connecting the way we measure galaxies to the way we measure stars, because stars is an easier problem. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we, what we do right now and, and what's wrong with that in a qualitative sense. Dan's talk after I'm done will cover how we're doing in a quantitative sense much more completely. Um, and then I'm going to finish up with what we intend to do and sort of preview fixes or possible fixes for the things that, that um, I will talk about and that Dan will talk about. So photometry. Um, I think it's, it's obvious to many of you, but I think it's often forgotten that the, I think the most important thing about photometry is that it has to respond linearly to true flux. And this has some interesting implications. Um, so why does it need to be linear? Well, if you take two observations of the same ensemble of objects, you need to get the same results on average, even if those two observations are taken in different conditions. Um, <clears throat> it's also true that you'd really like to get a consistent answer if you'd have the same object and you moved it a little bit further away. And by consistent, I mean, you know, consistent with angular diameter distances. Um, this is actually really, really hard for galaxies, and I'm not sure you can ever assume that it's actually achieved, but it's sort of the best we, it's what we, we'd like to imagine that we achieve when we try to use galaxy fluxes to do science. Um, anyhow, if you want your, linear, your photometry estimator to be linear, that means it can't depend on PSF size, because PSF size is, depends on your observing conditions. It can't depend on the surface brightness limit. That means you can't be doing any kind of isophoto flux. And it can't depend on Bayesian priors because Bayesian priors influence the results, you know, your posterior more when the observation contains less information. I'm not saying that you, that your um, uh, fluxes, whoops, what happened here? Um, all right, well, it's not going to do full screen. Um, the, uh, I'm not saying you can't use Bayesian um, statistics when you do photometry, but I am saying that the thing that we report in catalogs as photometry and use as photometry most of the time require that those things be likelihood based, not that they and that they not be posterior based. If you want to do Bayesian statistics, you need to do it at a higher level than what you report in a catalog. But it turns out that an estimator is always biased. It's always in the presence of noise if it's nonlinear, um, and even sort of a nominally mostly linear flux estimate is going to be biased if it depends on the shape or, or size measured in the same data. Conrad showed, you know, quantitatively how this was affecting them in, in some cases. Um, if it depends on the position measured from the same data. Um, and if it depends on having detected the object at all in the same data that you're using the measurement. And the result of this is that photometry is impossible. Um, which again is something Conrad already said. But Point source photometry is only slightly impossible, and that's why it's an, a, a useful thing to talk about and think about and how to connect it to galaxy photometry. Um, because for point source photometry, you just need a position, and I think positions can be constrained pretty well in the signal noise range we care about. So yes, things will be biased because you didn't get the position quite right, but that's usually subdominant. Um, and you need a PSF model, or a large aperture, so which means you need to have isolated objects, or just a spatially varying aperture correction of any kind, of any of the three kinds that Eli talked about, I think, if you have a spatially varying aperture correction, that's all you need um, to do good PSF photometry that's consistent. Um, in fact, actually, I'd say that you always need a spatially varying aperture correction of some kind to do PSF photometry. Um, a PSF model is never going to be good enough. A, uh, a practical aperture is never going to be large enough. And so you need to have aperture corrections. Um, and this gets back to a point that Eli made that that's just that all photometry is relative. Um, you know, at least if you're doing things on CCDs or things like CCDs, not photomultiplier tubes. There are astronomers who do non-relative photometry, but that's not what we're talking about here. Um, we don't need to get the PSF model right um, or even have a PSF model. Um, I think there's a little bit of a qualification there that you have to use the pixel weights carefully. If you're curious about that statement, ask me at the end. Um, the most important thing, and I'm repeating Eli now, you just need to count the same fraction of the photons for every star. Um, including the ones for which you know the true flux and then you've tied to the true flux from some other catalog and you're done. But galaxy photometry is definitely impossible. Um, so if, you, if your galaxy looks like this big one here, I could imagine that you can estimate the size and the ellipticity pretty well, 
um, for those to be subdominant when you're, and you know, the, the, the bias is on those to be subdominant when you derive a photometry estimator from that size and ellipticity. Um, you also need to estimate the PSF deconvolved profile well enough that you can define a consistent radius at which you want to integrate out the flux. If you're measuring that galaxy instead, you can't do those things. There just isn't enough information in the images to constrain the size and the shape and the profile. Um, but really for a, um, a, a multi-purpose survey like LSST, we really want to use the same estimator on all galaxies. So what do we do in practice? Um, normally, um, or I think the most common thing to do is do fit a PSF convolved galaxy model. And if you do that with a small number of parameters, um, because you want to stay robust when there isn't much information in the data. And in practice, I think that means you fit at most sort of an ellipse and a position and a flux. But you also want to fit with a large number of parameters to avoid significant model biases, you know, getting the profile wrong. Um, and that's obvious when there's a lot of information in the data, when you've got a well-resolved galaxy. Um, but you can still get biases on your, your faint little bits of fluff. Um, it's just not obvious that you've gotten a bias by using the wrong, by not having enough degrees of freedom in your model. Um, and in practice, I think this means at least you need to have position and flux and ellipses and something that says something about whether your galaxy is devocaler, uh, is devocaler or exponential. And I, ideally, you'd have even more than this. Um, of course, there's a gap between those two. And I think that means you probably do have to include priors on the structural parameters, the, the parameters that are ellipse and position and profile, not the, ideally the, the, a prior directly on the flux. Um, and then when you've, all, you've done all this, you need to make sure that what you've done is equivalent to PSF photometry and the radius goes to zero limit. As your PSF convolved galaxy model goes to a, has a deconvolved radius that goes to zero, it becomes a PSF and it should be equivalent to your PSF photometry. But while galaxy total fluxes, I think are impossible, I think Conrad, I think, said essentially the same thing. Um, I, galaxy colors, I think, might be kind of possible. Um, they're made up of stars, even if you can't resolve them. And if you have any estimator that gives each star the same weight in all bands, that color is a consistent color. This really gets at Eric's question at the end of Conrad's talk. Um, and it will correspond to a physically reasonable star formation history and dust, et cetera, at the redshift of that galaxy. Um, and you can do that. I think you can convolve all bands to the same seeing, you can measure the object with the same aperture in all bangs, or you can do something more cl clever, which is exactly what Conrad described, something more cl clever that guarantees that you get a consistent color. Now, I think another way to look at Eric's question is, that is a color. It may not be the same color you measured with the spectrograph on some other telescope looking at the, a, the same galaxy or a similar galaxy, but that's also not a total color. And all you can hope for in photometry is consistent colors. And I think that's a real problem for photo Z codes, especially the ones that rely on templates. And it makes me wonder whether our focus, the pixel people's focus on consistent colors is sort of talking past what the photo Z people are worried about. Um, and, I, and I think there's a bit of a gap there and we need to find some way to meet in the middle. But I think that it's also true that a consistent color is at some level all you can hope to measure. But it's worth pointing out that forward fitting of the kind I described two slides ago does not guarantee consistent colors of the type I described one slide ago. Um, if you fit a fit PSF convolved model, you only get consistent colors guaranteed if the seeing was already the same in all bands, which in which case you don't even need a PSF convolved model. You're just using your model as an aperture. And what matters is that it's the same in all bands. Um, and it's then required that the model actually be the same in all bands, um, aside from a single per band amplitude. Um, and that will guarantee you a consistent color. You can also imagine that maybe your galaxy model is flexible enough that it can actually fit the true morphology without any biases, and you can measure a total color, and that, give, that is a consistent color. But the, the last bullet point is just is completely theoretical, and I don't think it's ever going to be reflected in practice. And the first one, I think, results in consistent colors um, with some serious trade-offs. So that, that's um, what I wanted to say about actually measuring the fluxes. I'd like to, to say a little bit about measuring flux uncertainties, because I think there's also, I think, um, different ideas about what flux uncertainties should be. So if, if you're interested in a total flux, those depend on structural parameters. And, and you, we should, or we should let you, um, people using our catalogs marginalize over the uncertainties on our structural parameters in order to estimate the uncertainty on a total flux. Um, but colors should depend on the same structural parameters across all the bands. Um, so we shouldn't marginalize over uncertainties in those parameters when you're computing color uncertainties. Um, but there's a few problems with this. First off, 
the uncertainty estimates we come up with are derived from photon nodes for the most part, whether they're on the structural parameters or not. And that may not be all the errors. Um, and I've talked before about how you don't want to use Bayesian statistics here, but you can't marginalize likelihoods. You can only marginalize posteriors. Um, and so I think something has to give here. And it's another reason why photometry, by galaxy photometry in particular is, is at some level impossible and, and it's all a, a game of trade-offs. But everything I've said here is at some level subdominant, at least for the, the kinds of processing we're doing right now. I think in the impressive work that Conrad showed, this may not be the case, but I, I think for us and for as far as I know, anyone operating at HSC or LSST depths, this is the case. Um, good photometry requires good background subtraction and it requires good or at least non-catastrophic deblending. And even minor problems in these can lead to much bigger problems in galaxy fitting because the wings of galaxy profiles are basically impossible to distinguish from backgrounds. And as Conrad showed, you can get factors of two errors or, or bigger um, by including, uh, by getting the wrong profile. And if you get a little bit the wrong profile because you got a little bit of flux from a neighbor or the background wasn't quite estimated right, um, you end up with a situation where you put a little bit of garbage in and you got a lot of garbage out. And if you do a principled uncertainty estimate, a principled meaning that you just propagate the photon noise and you're very careful not to overcount things or, and you're not you know, adding fudge factors, they won't tell you you've gotten those things wrong. Um, now, you can make a good case that that's not actually principled. If you were principled, you would be propagating all the uncertainties from all your day blending and all your background estimation. Um, but no one does that in practice. All right, so if this is an impossible problem, what have we actually done? Um, I think I'm going to make a case that we have not solved this. We've taken a stab at this that reflects what's been done in the past and it's not working at LSST depths. Um, and that's essentially we've re-implemented the SDSS C model algorithm. Um, and you can think of C model as sort of a kludgy, easier to fit search substitute. Um, it means you fit an exponential model, you fit a de Vaucouleur model, um, and then you fit a linear combination of those two models holding their ellipse parameters fixed. Um, this sounds a little bit like a bulge density composition, but I think if it's, it's better to think of it as a search the linear combination is, ends up being highly correlated with Sersich um, index, and it's a, a way to essentially avoid the highly nonlinear Sersich parameter in view kind of almost as well. At least that was the case in SCSS. Um, our version uses, uh, approximates um, profiles as sums of Gaussians. This was an idea that I think a lot of people had, and, and many people use. Hogg and Lang really wrote the book on it. Um, the, we approximate the PSF as sums of shapelets for speed. Um, SDSS used sums of Gaussians and made some other approximations to the, um, uh, the PSF. Um, this part, approximating things as Gaussians, has worked well. Um, and I'm, I think no matter what we do with galaxy modeling, we're likely to include that. But overall, I think we regard our C model implementation as a placeholder for LSST. We know we need to replace it with something better, and you'll see evidence of that in, in Dan's talk later. Um, C models worked well in SDSS, but we've never been happy with it for HSC. And I think at least some of the problems, and perhaps most of them, are of the garbage in, garbage out nature. Um, the deblending and backgrounds are not in great shape. And our C model implementation seems to be quite sensitive to those kinds of problems, more so than other algorithms, um, more, other, more so than other fitting algorithms that we've tried. Um, it's certainly um, more sensitive to bad deblending and backgrounds than other flux measurements like our PSF fluxes or aperture fluxes. That part makes sense. It, as a galaxy model in code, it has many more degrees of freedom. And so it's, it's much more free to go crazy in the presence of garbage. Um, but because we go regarded as a placeholder, it's not seen any major developments since around 2016. Um, another code that we're working on um, is the one that's been developed by Dan, who's talking next. Um, he started work on this before he joined the DM team. He's now on the DM team. Um, this is multi-profit. It's not yet as fast as our C model implementation or fully integrated into our pipelines, but it's much more flexible in the kinds of models you can fit and the way in which you can fit it to data, especially multiband data. So we've been using it to explore different models and parameterizations and ways to combine information across bands. So you'll see Dan show plots of multi-profit. It's not what you can run sort of in a push button away with the rest of the DM pipelines, but it's been very useful for, for that sort of exploratory work. Um, another point about how we do photometry right now, um, another idea that we've actually lifted from SDSS is that we, in, in multiband processing, we fit a model to the coad for each band independently first. And then we pick the best band for each object using the first band in some priority order that meets certain signal noise criteria. So in the, the case of HSC, we look in the I band first. If the I band is sufficiently high signal noise, then we just use the I band structural parameters. And then if it's not good, then we use, move on to R then we use, I think, G and then Z and then Y. Um, 
Once we've done that, we've picked the best band per object. We, pro we remember which one we picked. Um, and then we do force photometry on the coads, um, holding the structure parameters fixed and just fitting the, for the fluxes. And this is the, the way we measure colors using, a using that reference uh, band structural parameters from the previous per band fits. On uncertainties, um, this is a figure from Eli Rykoff running on the desk DC2 simulations um, where they've got, you know, simulations so they have true galaxy uh, fluxes. And this is looking at um, cluster members and it's the pull. So this is essentially the, the a comparison between the um, actual distribution of, um, of flux errors from the predicted distribution of flux errors, our uncertainties. And if the uncertainties were good, then this would be a, a, a Gaussian distribution with a, a, a width of, with a sigma of one, and that's clearly not the case. The, our um, the the actual distribution is much broader than the uncertainties would suggest. So we're we're underestimating our uncertainties by something like a factor of three. So why is that? Um, part of it is what I talked about on Tuesday with coaddition. Um, I think I think this is just a hunch um, that the correlated no it's because the correlated noise is not propagated through to coaddition. Um, we certainly see uh, flux underestimates in our other measurements as well, and I, I think it's the big piece here. Um, but it's also true that the uncertainties in our structural parameters are not propagated to flux uncertainties. As I said, this is the right thing to do for colors, but it's the wrong thing to do for fluxes. Now, that doesn't get me out of trouble um, because these are actually um, pull distributions for colors, not for fluxes. So um, while this is true, it's, it's a reason this would be an underestimate for color for fluxes. It doesn't it, it doesn't explain the problem in those, that last plot. Um, it's also possible the measured colors could be internally cons uh, consistent and they could be consistent colors for some stellar population, but being inconsistent with the truth catalog fluxes, which are total fluxes. Um, I think this is unlikely to be the reason. It's, it's certainly unlikely to explain something like a, a, you know, a factor of three underestimated fluxes, but it's, it's there at some level. Um, Finally, the deblending and background estimation right now are per band. So those aren't forced while the rest of our, our photometry is forced. And the, their errors are not propagated into the flux uncertainties. And that could be um, adding a lot of actual, of, of actual scatter um, that's not reflected in our uncertainties as well. This would, for the most part, be seen in other flux measurements, except again, C model responds worse to problems in, in background estimation and deblending than other algorithms we've tested. So what do we intend to do to fix all this? Um, in multi-band processing, I think we need to drop this mesh ref force sequence um, in favor of using all bands simultaneously to constrain any structural parameter. So if you want to have a structural parameter that's held fixed when you fit across, when you measure um, consistently across different bands, you need to constrain it from all the bands. And the reason is that we, if you don't do this, you get discontinuities in ensemble measurements when your, your reference band switches from one band to the next one down. And you see this, especially in, in populations of dropouts where you can't really um, compare something that dropped out of, of I band to something that didn't drop out of I band because you, we use a different, um, uh, a systematically different set of structural parameters for those two ensembles. Um, in some cases, I think we may also fit models to each band independently after we've fit, fit these structural parameters. So you can, you know, try to get something like a total flux, um, but that's not what we do for colors. Um, we certainly plan to keep using multi-profit, at least for development work. I think um, we're certainly considering investing more time in optimizing it and integrating it into our production codes um, after evaluating some third-party options. I don't think there's any reason multi-profit has to be slower than C model, but we just haven't put the effort into making it go fast enough yet. But we do also plan to use third-party codes here. And, and we, you have heard about one of them um, that Conrad just talked about. I'm not certain that we, were, we would actually use this as a third-party code, but I think we're very interested in the algorithm. Um, we have a lot of the low-level building blocks for um, putting together an implementation of it, like PSF matching. And I think we'd, we'd, we'd like to write one and, and include that. Um, you heard about Fred talk about Scarlet as a deblender. Um, but it's, it's designed to generate consistent colors itself and at least robust total fluxes. I think it's an open question whether it's, fluxes, it's total fluxes are isophotal to an extent that would bias them significantly or whether they're isophotal to an extent that just totally doesn't matter at the level of precision we have. Um, and I, I'm almost certain that later today you'll hear from Aaron Sheldon about his code NGMix. 
um, which produces photometry as well as, as well as shear estimates. And it's been used to fit models of the kind that we're, 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 we've been testing with multi-profit um, and are leaning towards from those tests. So we plan to fully integrate that anyway, and it may just be what we can use for galaxy photometry as well. So I hope we will have multiple options, all of which are better than C model um, by the time we get to DR1. So where does all that leave us? Um, our primary goals for galaxy photometry were linearity, um, equivalency to point source photometry in the R equals zero limit, robust consistent colors, robust total fluxes, and hence to um, total colors, um, and useful uncertainties. And all of these are at some level impossible, except maybe equivalency to point source photometry. Um, starting from the end, our, our uncertainties are not useful right now. Um, I think we've got good theories on why, but we need to do the work to fix them. Oops, sorry. Um, robust total fluxes. Um, these look pretty bad um, when you compare to true fluxes, but it's hard to know what parts of the pipeline to, to blame. Again, this is garbage in, garbage out. We know background estimation and deblending are things that we're struggling with at these depths, um, and galaxy photometry codes are probably exacerbating the problem, but not responsible entirely. Robust consistent colors. Um, we don't quite have the right metrics for this yet. I think in order to tell whether your, your color is consistent as opposed to you know, matching some true total flux that came from some truth catalog, you actually need to be able to try to compute photo Z's. You need to do with the photo Z algorithm that can make use of a consistent color as opposed to the particular color of a particular cell of, um, population it was expecting. Um, and so I think we can only really guess at how we're doing right now. Um, certainly comparing to truth colors gives us a lower bound on how well we're doing, but um, I think this is also an opportunity to ask whether consistent colors are actually useful in practice. They're intended for people who do photo Z's. And if photo Z's are expecting, you know, templates that look like spectrophotometry or um, something else and are planning to tweak everything they do to match what our photometry looks like anyways, I think it's still, a, it's a little bit of a question about whether we are hammering on an accuracy problem when there's a much bigger precision or robustness problem. Um, equivalency to point source photometry. This, always, this has always looked pretty good. That's because it's an, a very easy thing to test. You can just plot your, your galaxy photometry versus your PSF photometry as a function of magnitude and make sure it makes sense. Um, and so I think we've got this under control. Um, and then linearity. I think, again, the, the interactions between the background subtraction and the aperture correction that Eli talked about um, are currently causing problems. But on the, for the most part, this seems to mostly be okay in the algorithms themselves. And I think if we can get the background subtraction under control, um, this will be okay. All right, that's it for my part of the talk. Um, I think I'll maybe answer any sort of qualify, uh, any immediate questions right now, but I, we can also save a lot of questions after, um, uh, until after Dan's talk. And I think questions about how well we're doing um, should certainly wait until after Dan's talk. Um, I'll stop sharing now so Dan can start. Okay, thank you, Jim. Round of applause, uh, please, for Jim on Slack. We have one question um, from Conrad. I believe it is. Just unmute Conrad. Go ahead. Um, it, it's more of a comment, and maybe it can wait till the end. Okay, in that case, we don't have any more questions lined up yet. So I will, Dan, I will unmute you and you are good to go. Okay, thank you. I'm just gonna share this. You see this and you can hear me? Yes. Okay. So I'll try to go through this a little more quickly, but also explain exactly what you're seeing. So I've been working on the galaxy modeling Here's what I will and won't talk about. I'll talk about performance, and by that I mean accuracy, precision, robustness, and runtime, both on simulations and real data. That includes how well we're doing with CModel right now, and also how in progress alternatives like MultiProfit and NGMix do. I won't talk about how useful the errors and uncertainties are. That's what Jim talked about briefly, uh, mainly because I haven't done a lot of work on that yet. And the same is true for multi-object fitting and background model fitting. And uh, it's not because they're not possible, we just haven't devoted much time to testing those. And stars, I won't say much about, they're basically fine, as Jim pointed out. So here's some of the terminology, C model, 
as Jim said, it's implemented in the mesh model fit package in our software. I'm going to refer to that as the stack for short. Multi-profit, which I'll abbreviate it as MPF, has a number of different models, but I'm mainly going to talk about the CERSIC implementation. NGMix, um, I'm not sure how much Aaron will say about this in the next talk, but it is essentially a constrained bulge disk model with a fixed size ratio between the bulge and the disk. And it has been used in real surveys to some success. Under the hood, all of these are Gaussian mixtures. And basically, it's, it's not feasible to do it any other way in the testing we found. I won't talk about more complicated models. And the short answer is that we have tried them, but none of them work any better than the ones I, I will talk about. So how well does C model perform? It's quite fast. It's fine for stars, but not so much for galaxies. And I'll show you plots um, to demonstrate that. So here are some plots showing the robustness, um, or sorry, the precision. So we measure this um, by what we call repeatability metrics and validate the RP package. These are essentially measuring the same object multiple times over individual visits. And we check how consistent the outputs are across these different visits. So on the right, I'm showing the stellar photometry from C model in different signal to noise bins. And this is the repeatability in millimags. And on the left, the same thing for the galaxies. And basically in every single signal to noise bin, we are uh, less precise in our galaxy photometry than we are for stars. So we're quite far from the noise limit, even assuming that the stars are at or close to the noise limit. Okay, now for robustness. I'm gonna show a lot of these plots. So let me just briefly explain what they are. They're showing on the x-axis as a function of magnitude, um, various quantities. For now, this is the size, so the half-life radius uh, from the CERSIC model as a function of magnitude. And I've binned up the points with the KD. You can see outliers in black and blue. And I have the percentiles. So this black, one, black line here is the running median, essentially. Uh, so you can see galaxies follow trends in apparent si or size in pixels as a function of apparent magnitude. There's a lot of outliers that are too big. Um, these aren't real low surface brightness objects. They're basically junk, and I'll show you some examples before uh, next. Um, sorry, I lied. These, these are actually the sizes from C model. Um, I should have updated that slide. All right, and then on the right, you can also, if you squint here, you can see there's a pileup of objects around this size here. This is where the size prior is in C model. Um, it's basically low signal to noise objects will be dragged towards that size prior. And the very tiny things are hopefully stars, but we haven't actually confirmed they all are. Okay, I'm gonna show you a lot of plots from the desk DC2 simulation. Uh, we've heard this mentioned before, but not really described. I'll, just say these are basically based on a cosmological simulation. You can see the details in that link there. Um, Desk has generated uh, LSST like images for based on these simulations and then process them with a fairly recent version of our pipelines. And here's an image of what that looks like for a semi random selection. Um, and essentially, this is a very idealized model of what LSST images might look like and or Rubin Observatory. And the only real complications are. The galaxies are made up of a bulge and a disk. The disk has some fraction of its light um, in clumps rather than being completely smooth and some small fraction of very bright galaxies have an AGN in the center. But other than that, this is uh, sort of the best case scenario for galaxy photometry in the real world. So how are we doing on accuracy? Well, we have quite large biases. So these plots show as a function of G, R, and I band magnitude, the C model photometry ver um, versus the true photometry. So the difference between the two. And uh, so the median line is not at zero, which means we have a net bias. And also the scatter decreases down to about 20th magnitude and then increases again. So bright galaxies are nowhere near noise dominated. In fact, they become increasingly systematic dominated. And there's a significant fraction of outliers. So a few percent on either end are more than 0.4 mags off. Now I've kept the R band plot and shown to the left and the right, the G minus R color and the R minus I color for comparison. So the colors are not a whole lot better. Um, the R minus I is where the G minus R has approximately the same large scatter. Uh, it 
the scatter behaves a little better for brighter galaxies. But we still have the same fairly large fraction of a few percent um, extreme outliers. Jim mentioned this force photometry and I'm going to sort of switch between the two. So you can see it improves the color significantly, uh, but it doesn't really change the fluxes. Now this is with multi-profit. Uh, I'm showing only the G minus R colors here because uh, those behave the worst before, as shown before, uh, worse than R minus I. So two things improve the colors. Uh, one is just going from single band to multi band. And we already saw that comparing the forest to the single band measurements with C model. But also changing from C model to a Cirsic model improves the colors. And curiously, that's not true for single band fits. It's only true for the multi band fits. So if you just continue doing single band fits, it doesn't really matter, matter which model you use, um, not significantly anyways. Um, we haven't completely fixed the bias, uh, but the scatter is reduced quite significantly. So interesting thing is NGMix has basically the same kind of performance with its uh, VD model. Um, it slightly improves fluxes in single band mode. But if I flip between the two, you can see the G minus R scatter on the rightmost plots is almost exactly the same. And I was quite almost stunned by this. So here's showing uh, the difference between the NG mix and multi-profit colors, G minus R colors. And for about 80% of the objects that were within a few tens of millimags, so a few percent level, which I found shocking because galaxy photometry never works that well, uh, except for when that's not true. And so for about 5% of the galaxies in either direction, they, there's sort of a, a very broad tail where the colors disagree quite significantly. Um, but this is still a good indicator that we're robust in the sense that two different codes using two different models give more or less the same answer. Okay, so back to the single band fluxes. This is comparing on the left uh, the multi profit CERSIC with a Forge C model in the middle and NG mix on the right. And basically they behave differently. Um, I would say the CERSIC does probably the best, but it doesn't really solve any of the problems. We still have large scatter for bright galaxies. It's smaller than C model, but it's not always smaller. So at the very faint end, it's not doing better. Um, I'm probably going to skip to this fairly quickly, but we attempted to use HST um, as sort of another truth catalog, even though we don't know the ground truth for galaxies, just because uh, in the cosmos field, we have very deep images from both HST and HST, and they're quite well resolved in HST. So I'm not going to compare the magnitudes, um, basically because they didn't match very well, and uh, we need to do a better job of calibrating before we can look at those. But for the sizes, for the most part, if you look at isolated galaxies that are not heavily blended, um, the sizes from HST and from HSC agree kind of surprisingly well. And where they don't agree is for poorly resolved objects where we were not going to get a credible size anyways. So here are some of the outliers. I'm showing you on the left uh, a GR, oh, sorry, a ZIR uh, postage stamp from HSC versus the same object in HST. And these are all supposed to be isolated galaxies or isolated objects. And you can see clearly for the three on the top, they're not isolated. They're this is essentially a failure in detection in um, our pipelines. And some of them could be solved. So this example on the left, we should probably be able to split that into a galaxy and a star. But for this one on the right, it's unclear even in HST exactly what's going on, whether that's a train wreck of a galaxy or four or five sources all blended together. And the two examples on the bottom are cases of garbage in, garbage out, um, where clearly something has gone wrong in the sky subtraction or the deep blending. Um, but there really is a galaxy there that we should be able to measure. And we also have a bunch of cases of garbage in, garbage out where there's nothing there, uh, so a false positive. And that wouldn't have shown on any of the plots I showed before. Okay, so sorry, I gave you a bit of a whirlwind tour through this. So here are my conclusions. Um, C model is fast. I didn't show you, uh, I, I can show you if you want plots of per object runtimes, but it basically performs as quickly as it can, but not very well. But at least we have learned that multiband fitting helps. Um, it helps a lot with colors, maybe not so much with fluxes, but there's essentially no reason not to do it. 
So better models, um, we expected SIRSIC to perform better than CMOL. That's true for colors, but again, not so much for fluxes. Um, the only really improved colors though, if you do multiband fitting, not so much in single band. So NGMix and MultiProfit agree on color. So to, in some sense, they're robust in that if they give a wrong answer, at least they give the same wrong answer. Unfortunately, NGMix and MultiProfit are both much slower. So if you tally up the total runtime for all of the objects in the plots I showed, it's about 10 times slower than C model uh, and for NGMix and 30 something times slower for MultiProfit. And that's essentially because both of them have a significant amount of Python overhead, whereas C model is all C++ and it's been optimized pretty much as far as it can be. So it's solvable, but it's not a trivial problem. And I'll stop here and take questions. Okay, thank you, Dan. Let's thank Dan with a round of virtual applause. So Conrad, we can ask, I can unmute you. Okay, Conrad, you can go ahead with your question now. So, so let me ask about this multiband um, fitting. So I understand right that you somehow combine all the data you have to fit a single photometric model and then you simply scale it up and down to fit it to all the different bands that you have. Yes, right. so I think from the models I showed, um, definitely from Multiprof and also for NGMix, they have the same structural parameters across all bands. And there's just right. a- So supposing that that's not the case, of Sorry? So supposing that, that supposing that that's not the case, that the scale length of your disk increases with uh, towards the blue, for example, how do you how do you recognize this and how do you interpret your monster? I mean, it will give some sort of a bias. You could look at structure and the residuals. Um, I did briefly mention we've looked at more complicated models that can have color gradients. Um, so, for example, if you just take any one of these Gaussian mixtures and do a linear fit for the amplitudes in of each Gaussian independently. Uh, that basically makes every plot I showed worse. So it should be possible, but we don't have a solution that actually works in practice yet. By worse, you mean noisier, not, not more biased? Uh, both the biases and the scatter get worse at basically every magnitude. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Okay, Robert, we have a couple of questions from you. Okay, so <clears throat> Dan, color gradients. Um, what is the Peyton Hall belief in how one ought to handle color gradients in galaxies? I note that Eli doesn't believe there are color gradients. That's because he works on red mapper. You're asking me what your own belief is. No, I'm asking what the belief you're expected to believe, which isn't quite the same thing, because I've brainwashed Jim as well. I believe there are color gradients, whether they're, or are you still wanting me to repeat your belief? No, no, I want you to discuss what you're, we're, we're planning to do about color gradients, and based on your experience, not my prejudices. Well, I would like multi-component models to work, but unfortunately, um, those haven't really been shown. We could do something like uh, the NGMix BD model and simply uh, float the amplitudes of the bulge and the disk separately, um, which yeah. should come closer to uh, dealing with galaxies that really have color gradients. It won't solve, you know, disks with color gradients, but that's probably going to be a small handful of the brightest galaxies, which aren't going to work very well for other reasons. The metallicity gradients in giant ellipticals are another case of real color gradients. Yeah. But I, I guess that I think myself that most of the color gradients people worry about, you can describe as multiple populations, but multiple is of order two. And that's the motivation of the bulge plus disc where you float the colors. Now, if you don't think that's going to work, uh, then we have an interesting question. Um, and exactly how you float the structural parameters of different components of galaxies is something a lot of people have worked on, including people like um, Lance Miller in the um, slightly different context. So you were, you were making negative noises about uh, multi-component fits. Was that based on, I don't know, what was that based on? I've tried a number of different things. Like I said, simply linear fits of the amplitudes of each Gaussian. 
I've also tried two component models of various flavors. Um, it takes a lot of effort to get those to run robustly. And even if they do, they're slower by, you know, factors of several to 10 to yeah. orders of magnitude. So we just haven't devoted the required effort. It's not clear if we did devote more effort that it would actually work better. Yeah, I think I, I would say that the, the two component model is a nice way to think about things. Um, but it's, I think there, there's a possibility that there, that the space of, of galaxies where it matters is so well resolved and so bright that it's not a good model. Um, so, you know, say giant ellipticals um, and the space of galaxies um, where it is good enough is also the space of galaxies where it's too many degrees of freedom. Um, there may be a middle space where I think that model works, but I, I'm not as confident in that model as um, a solution as I once was, although I think it's still a good way to think about the problem. So we need to come up with a set of experiments to discover whether it's important to free up the models enough to handle the color gradients that exist in most galaxies. Is that a way of saying, is that a fast statement? Perhaps, but it's not clear if that should be our highest priority anyways. I don't understand that response. Doing the experiment seems like a priority, even if fixing it is not. I mean, in other words, part of asking how well we do on, gal on multi-component galaxies is an important question. Whether we work on fixing that depends on you know, how well, well it works. There's also, how is. We need to do those experiments, but I think yeah. those, it's, we should be prepared for the possibility that those experiments will leave us with a scientific trade-off that we'll have to choose between science cases um, or you know, treating different galaxies different ways. Yeah. Okay. If we have no more questions, thank you again, Dan and Jim, for the overview of our project plans.